the push is for interactive skins on buildings that are 3D printed or manufactured. You know, some of it is is going to be modularized. Some of it is going to be on-site fabricated by robots. It's almost like the auto industry meets the construction site. Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of building and remodeling. Join us as we explore an industry which is always evolving with new products, designs, practices, and technologies. From builders to remodelers to executives, as well as just those with outside perspective, each episode of Construction Disruption is going to meet with forward thinkers as well as other in-the-know folks who want to share their unique insights. Construction Disruption is created and sponsored by Isaiah Industries, a manufacturer of specialty metal roofing systems and other building materials. I'm Todd Miller. My co-host is our sales manager, Seth Heckeman. Creative director, Ryan Bell, and content creator, Ethan Young, are our behind-the-scenes production team. So, Seth, um, a lot of times at this point in the podcast, we have some sort of witty banter. At least that's what we think <laughs> it we, is. I we don't try know. to be witty. Try to be. Um, always a favorite of mine, though. But this time, a lot of times we'll start that out with me asking you a question. So this time, I want to do something different. Why don't you ask me a question? Um, and just so our listeners and viewers know, I have no idea what he's going to ask me. So um, this is a little risky. Of course, I sign his paycheck, so it's probably not too <laughs> risky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have some mo- motivations to to s- lobby a softball, hopefully. But yeah, so thinking about what question to ask, I you know was thinking you know obviously you're uh, in the trenches with us here day to day at Isaiah Industries and what we do in, in metal roofing. But uh, so much of your career has been spent also on kind of an industry wide. Uh, level for metal construction as a whole um, with our trade associations that were a part of Metal Construction Association and Metal Roofing Alliance. And so taking, you know, not just here at Isaiah, but an even 30,000 foot level and beyond of our industry as a whole, I was curious what, um, as we've been thinking more about innovation and disruption and where things are going, um, what skills, goals, perspectives do you feel like we're missing right now as an industry. And I'm curious too, then if, if part of that is what, um, what disciplines, what other, how, where do we need to reach outside of our industry to bring into uh, conversation and collaboration to really move things forward and, and be ahead of the curve, so to speak, uh, looking out into the future? Yeah, that wasn't a softball. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, two things come to mind. Um, And I don't know if they exactly address your question, but they're still what comes to mind. So it's what I'm going to share. But um, one is, of course, I've long been a advocate of companies working together, Um, companies that historically might see themselves as competitors instead being able to work together. And I think that's how an industry or that's how anything can really advance. I I think it's bad um, if we're all working individually in silos. Now, that said, I think that those same companies who are working together have to be quick to bring in outsiders and disruptors and new ideas that may come into Um, the industry and bring them into the fold. Um, But I think that idea of folks working together um, and, you know, just really brainstorming on, um, hey, what does the future look like? Um, I think that, you know, as we see here, a lot of speed of change um, just keeps increasing. And so that puts the onus on all of us to be better at preparing for change and preparing for a future and really building and growing into that future. Um, As far as, you know, what do I think needs to be brought into it? um, One of the things I I think there's a lot of synergy. I mean, I think if you look at, I think culture in general moves as a whole, it moves together. I don't think, you know, construction moves this way or at this speed and literature moves this speed and art moves this speed or interior design moves this speed or, you know, even religion. I I I think that, you know, the more we can get 
um, all those outside perspectives together and figure out, okay, what can construction do that benefits all these other areas? What can literature do that benefits all these other areas? What can faith do that benefits all these other areas? Um, I think that that, that really helps. And, and I think that today, um, with our ability to communicate um, and use communication, hopefully in positive ways, not the negative ways that sometimes social media and things can allow people to lash out and, and do stuff negatively. Um, but I think um, being very positive in that respect and, and getting everyone to pull together, I think can help and benefit everybody, um, you know, including the disenfranchised, including the marginalized, including those who are struggling. Um, so how can we all work to serve that purpose of, of helping? helping others and helping each other and uh, advancing the world. And in our case, because it comes out of our faith, you know, growing God's kingdom as well. So that's kind of my answer, I guess. Fantastic. Thank you. So that was kind of fun to do it that way. Thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased to hear from our guest today um, and see where this conversation leads. Uh, this is a gentleman who I first ran across on LinkedIn. Um, as a lot of you know, I do a lot on LinkedIn um, and really enjoy it and, and really found it to be a great way to uh, connect with people I otherwise never would have met or connected with. Um, but when I saw this particular gentleman, I knew that this was someone I needed to know more about. So today I'm very pleased that we're visiting with a gentleman by the name of Billy Ream. Um, Billy hails from North Jersey, uh, which at the time when he was growing up was an electric train commute for his father, um, who was a Wall Street banker in New York City. Billy took a year between high school and Miami University, which is Miami of Ohio, here in Oxford, Ohio, about an hour from us. Um, he took a year between high school and entering Miami University's architecture program. Come to think of it, Billy, you were probably at Miami about the same time my sister was, now that I think about it, um, in order to tour the United States before he eventually did settle in Oxford, Ohio, and eventually Cincinnati, Ohio, to grow both his career and also a family. His studies there resulted in a bachelor degree in environmental design and a master's in architecture. His other interests include art, nature, and philosophy. Billy has had a long career as an architect. He was licensed in 1990. Um, he worked at one time for Macy's, um, but then he also worked for firms such as EGC Construction, CDS Associates, PDT Architects, and SFA Architects. That's a lot of initials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years of practice, he transitioned into higher education uh, with five years as an assistant professor of professional practice and architecture in service to University of Cincinnati's DAAP program. In 2018, then, Billy relocated to his wife's hometown of beautiful and historic Florence, Alabama, and that's where he founded Rue House 3D. Um, Billy, it's really a pleasure to have you join us here on Construction Disruption. Um, you've had a great career in architecture. Um, tell me, you and I are, I think, roughly the same age. I remember growing up watching Mr. Brady on the Brady Bunch, and he'd work on these drawings, and I remember him carrying Carrying that set of drawings around during the episode where they visited Kings Island outside of Cincinnati. And I was thinking, wow, it would be kind of cool to be an architect. Um, curious, what called you to this line of work? Was an architect something you always wanted to be? Well, thanks for having me on, uh, Todd and Seth. It's a real pleasure. Um, yeah, did, before I get into that, let me say that uh, the Brady Bunch had impact on me too, even to the point <laughs> of having a a Ford Torino wood-sided wagon when I was in college. And so Good deal. I really played that role a little too much. <laughs> and, and I ended up with four boys, not quite six, but I did all right. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I caught the architecture bug, if you will, uh, in high school, uh, freshman year, uh, a friend of mine was taking a drafting class and there was a, a wonderful elderly mentor teaching this, a, just a, a super wise engineer. And uh, he would put daily quotes up on the, the blackboard 
um, from any philosophy or faith, and, and it was basically just to raise virtue and character and awareness about growing up. And, and so it was one of my absolute favorite teachers. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, we started with mechanical drafting, then we got into architectural drafting. And something in me, uh, maybe because I just love to doodle, and all of my uh, book covers were always filled with drawings, uh, love this idea that um, this is a career in which you communicate not only in word, but also graphically. And so being a visual person, as well as a person of the word, uh, it just rang my bell and I kept with it. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. So during your time, um, career as an architect, you've certainly seen a lot of changes. I'm kind of curious, um, what are your feelings on the changes you've seen? Have they made life as an architect more challenging or less challenging or? Both. Both. Yes. And, the, and let me explain that. So the, the, what's easier is actually documenting. Um, I learned back in the day where we actually used T bars and parallel bars and we hand drafted on various papers with various mediums and and it was very tedious and anytime you had to make a change it was a lot of eraser dust all over the place and <laughs> and, and and a lot of time spent to make a change and we so the onset of the computer um, and CAD as it's known computer-aided drafting and um, AutoCAD and a few other programs uh, and, and and even the use of things like spreadsheets and and uh, word processing all came together to make uh, documenting our um, job and our, our visions much much easier and especially changing anything a lot easier uh, what's become more complex is our accountability to uh, more and more regulation and that's not a bad thing um, Building codes have improved. They've, um, you know, during my tenure, if you will, uh, energy code came out, and we and we be, and architects had to become much more um, educated on the energy use of their buildings and their efficiencies. Also, programs like LEED uh, came out, and uh, when I was working on uh, schools for Ohio, I had a. 2,500 page manual for actually going about something that we used to do really kind of shoot from the hip and based on what we did the last project right so so we had a lot of people uh, looking over our shoulders to certify uh, that we are doing things diligently and, and 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 on behalf of the taxpayers dollars so that makes a lot of sense uh, also, I think clients have become more savvy about um, what a home or a building or a facility can can provide them. Uh, and of course, they want more for less. So we have to become better at um, understanding the budget and um, you know being on top of those numbers as well, which architects are notoriously terrible at, I might add. <laughs> Interesting. So... You know, when I think about, you know, construction, to me, a lot of it times it comes down to a, a property owner, um, occupants who may or may not be the owner, a designer, architect. It comes down to the products, the companies that make the products and the contractors who put it all to pull it all together and supposedly make it become reality. I'm just curious, do you have any thoughts? thoughts on the relationships between those parties or and whether those relationships work or don't work or perhaps how things could be better? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you go all the way back in the history of and Europe of uh, cathedrals, the uh, term architect wasn't really there. It was master builder. Oh, wow. So the, archi the architect was um, someone who understood geometries, understood um, instinctively and through the trade, uh, the nature of load and how weight would transfer through the building. So they had a lot of structural engineering uh, without the calculations as much. 
and um, they had to manage the build. And so uh, it, as all things in our uh, society went, we became more and more specialized. So architects kind of fell out of having that construction savvy, you know, being on site and, and as much. And you know, some architecture firms offer construction administration services to complement, you know, what the construction managers are doing. And that's a good thing. And we had that at SFA. Um, so there are so many people to be in tight communication with. And, and this, is, this is something that I brought up with my students at UC. And, you know, they're all coming to school all excited that they're going to, you know, make these fancy buildings and, and, and be kind of artists and heroes and maybe get paid a lot, which is kind of a myth. But anyway, you know, they're, they're, they're all excited about this. And, and their first lesson from me was design is not your lead as an architect. Hmm. It's communication. Hmm. It's wow. all about communication. It's all about collaboration. It's all about documentation. Design is secondary. And, and that was a wake up call because not everyone in that room or every room in every term was really big on communication. As a matter of fact, a lot of the kids were kind of squirreled away in their digital worlds. And, uh, and so a big part of um, teaching architecture was getting the kids to come out of their shells and to begin to communicate with um, themselves and um, different collaborators, uh, especially in co-op, because uh, that's what I was leading. So they had to talk with uh, uh, architects, they had to talk with HR departments, and then once they went on co-op or they spent a term with a firm, then they had to meet and, and serve many of the same people that the experienced architects do. So it was a huge wake up call on how much of a community it takes to build. Can you flesh that out a little bit more of why or some examples of why communication is, is important and you know, what, how that can make the process better and, and accomplish bigger, better things? Sure, so you have, the, the client is coming with expectations and each nature of client comes with a different set of expectations. Okay, so a developer will have a different set of expectations because they're basically trying to, you know, maximize this facility's profitability and also possibly establish a brand and a, and a quality, you know, that is associated to their name as they continue multiple projects. And then of course they have relationships with the bank and everything that they have to make work. And then an end user, like a, someone who's having a custom home built or let's say a doctor's office, anything like that, they're concerned about more about the functionality of the space, right? And so then you have to dive into their life. You have to dive into the daily routines of your client and understand just hundreds of factors, everything from the role of natural light in what they're doing here, there and there versus task lighting or um, it could be sound disruption from rain. It could be uh, someone in their staff being uh, like, likely to have a chill because they might be older or, or, might, or maybe they're younger and want more energy and aliveness in their workspace. And so then there's workspace satisfaction. So, you know, we have so many employers that um, are really concerned with turnover. And so how can the architect and, and team in tandem with the interior designer uh, create an HR, create a place that is, you know, exciting, viable, you know, all of that. And so, yeah, I could just go on and on about how much communication needs to be done up front. That's called pre-design and programming. That we used that word programming before the <laughs> computer world did. <laughs> We used the word architecture before the computer world did, and they're ripping us off. I, I was about to say, yeah, they've really <laughs> yeah. stole that one too. Yeah, they're they're really jumping on our boat. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, Eddie, over your career, any particular really memorable projects you've worked on? 
They're all memorable. Are they? Are they? <laughs> yeah, as long as I have my memory. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I have. Um, I, I think there's two that really come forward, and I'm going to save one because I know you're going to have a question about problematic stuff okay. and how we resolve that, right? Okay. So I'm going to save. I'm going to save that one. Okay. So the last project I did in Cincinnati, uh, I was subcontracting uh, as an independent uh, with SFA. I had already wrapped up with UC and I was really on my way out the door to come down south. And I had this wonderful opportunity to do one last project. And so what that was, was to uh, create a display case for the historic murals that had come from the Union Terminal and then had gone to the airport. Yeah. And they, clo and they closed two of those terminals down. And so there was these wonderful murals that no one wanted to, to have destroyed, but it was a very expensive proposition to move them because they were tens of tons each. Wow. And so we had to create some way to display them um, at the convention center. And so I got the opportunity to design that that box, if you will, uh, with some really wonderful uh, glazing systems out front and um, some tricky code uh, analysis up front so I didn't have to uh, go by the typical habitable space requirements. So that allowed me to, to um, continue to uh, pare down costs because the city wanted that cost to come in on, on budget. And um, yeah, and so I left um, having displayed both history and art and, and, and a way to celebrate the city. And that just meant a lot to me. And uh, because I'm also going into a role in my re semi-retirement as an artist. And so it was almost like a gateway project for me or a bridge project that said, oh yeah, you're leaving Cincinnati, but you're entering the realm of art. So what a wonderful uh, symbolic uh, project. Very neat. So is that still in place at the convention center? Oh yeah. Uh, it, we were yeah. just there. I, have, I don't remember. We'll have to look for it next time we're down there. It's on the west side. You know, you know okay. the big, uh, the big canvas sign uh, with the white panels that says Cincinnati. As you drive by Cincinnati okay. on seventy one seventy five, you're coming across the river. Um, it is all along the base. Okay. Of that big iconic sign. Uh, I look Very forward cool. to checking that out yeah, next absolutely. time. Absolutely. By all means, that's neat. So I'll lead into the next question, though. So have you had anything unexpected, problematic happen on a project that really threatened your vision for the project? And how did you, how, how'd that go? How'd you work through it? Well, let me change the scale altogether. So we're going to go from an inner city commercial project to a farmhouse. Okay. Okay. So there was a, a couple uh, out east of Cincinnati that in the rural areas that wanted to build a separate house for grandma. And the zoning would not let them have a second residence on a single lot. Okay. So even though they had many acres, they didn't want to subdivide their acreage and create a separate lot for grandma. They still wanted to keep it consolidated. And so then they were faced with the idea of linking the house to their house. And, you know, at first we thought, okay, we'll do a nice little carport kind of uh, breezeway walk, mm -hmm. just a little covered walk, and maybe we can get the, the city to acknowledge that as a separate or as the same building, not a separate mm -hmm. residence. And they wouldn't have any of it. They, they were like, no, it has to be a valid addition part of the square footage of the home you can't you can't connect it that way and so the the owner was getting a little frustrated because there was not a good spot to actually attach grandma's mini house if you will to their home they have a beautiful uh, historic farmhouse too and there are a lot of trees all the way around a beautiful deck in the back 
and um, they thought the project was over. They didn't think they were going to be able to do it. And, and, and I said, no, wait a minute, let's really look at this. And so in an area that was ideal for view and for um, being adjacent to the decks and, and, and also kind of giving her some privacy, um, I suggested that we actually put her addition on piers so that we wouldn't disrupt the root system of the adjacent trees, one of which was only 18 inches away. And it was a beautiful old oak. And so we, um, and also we had to take a look at the, the health of the tree and the canopies and all this other stuff. And at first they were a little nervous about it all, but then when they realized that in, the, in my schemes that I'm gonna give grandma a little kitchenette and some of her cooking can ha go through this pass through into the into their dining room. Uh, they got real excited. So grandma's cooking was the leverage to, to get this addition <laughs> done. And and um, and it turned out in, in and this is this kind of led into the tiny house stuff a little bit. It turned out in a space that was only 18 by 18. We did a master bedroom, uh, a bonsai greenhouse, a kitchenette. Uh, a, a uh, study area and a bathroom. Wow. That's amazing. And, and, it, was, and, and it doesn't feel small with the, with the, with the uh, roof volumes and the, uh, you know, like for instance, the separating the, the greenhouse space from the bedroom. I used an open uh, built in cabinetry with, pat, you know, with see through areas where she could feature her bonsai plants. And then, and so it, that way, all the space kind of it was an open plan, but yet there was senses of division between those functions. So it was tricky, you know. And sometimes it's the the small projects that are tricky. Yeah, you know, like they're that. not so they're not so cookie cutter, you know. Like like I said, with the schools, you know, even with all those regulate, actually, all those regulations make them cookie cutter. You get a little bit of flair and a, and a design here or there and some masonry work or a theming, uh, some interior tile work in the main, you know, entry or something, but maybe to do something a little unique in the gym. But it's, it's, it's actually homes that are more challenging than most commercial projects. Yeah, that makes sense, especially when I think about, you know, the building code draw, drives a lot of that and kind of drives design in some cases. That's a pretty cool story, though, and it was all the uh, grandma's cooking was the catalyst to make that all happen. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So where do you find your inspiration for design? What does that process look like for you? Do you start with a lot of hand sketches, or how does that work for you? Well, yes. Uh, a matter of fact, I went to an AIA convention many years ago in New Orleans, and um, I entered the napkin the napkin sketching contest. And uh, because that's like a classic thing that architects do, right? Sure. It goes way back, and I won. Oh wow! I a, uh, yeah, that was really that's like one of the points of pride I have. So it's it's not a big thing to stake one's ego, but you know what? I love sketching. I love drawing. I have about fifty journals filled with sketches wow. wow and i never stop sketching probably have one yeah i always have one within hand hands reach or whatever and so no accounting for how good these sketches might end up being that i just flip to but yeah here's an example oh wow. my goodness that's gorgeous so for our listeners on the podcast billy's showing us a very detailed uh, sketch of a of a building design and some ideas and very cool. Mm -hmm. So do you still have the award-winning napkin? I think I have a picture of it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's tucked away in one of my sketchbooks. I don't know. I, I didn't frame it. I didn't go that far. Um, but they, I did win a, a nice drawing set of, of inks and pencils from it. So that was kind of fun. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that is basically we start with sketches. But to be honest with you, that is not really where you start. Okay. You have to start with your heart. Uh -huh. and, and that's really what it's all about. You, you have to have a heart for what you're doing. So if, if you don't have a passion for your client's mission, if you don't have a passion for 
uh, the site that that building is going to be built in. If you don't have a passion for the community that is the context for that project, you will not end up with good architecture. Wow. Mm. And, and so it's developing those passions in collaboration with others who share them with you and um, really bringing about a sense of, um, uh, it's more than a, a, a sense of uh, accommodation. It's, it's a deep and abiding affirmation of life itself. When a client walks in and they get their occupancy permit, for a good project and 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 because they've gone through a process it's not just the materials that they're walking into they've gone through a process and they know how this is going to function ahead they know that those employees are going to be taken care of they know that you know a lot of their concerns have been met and and it becomes a celebration really it's really great to to walk through projects uh, as they near completion so it sounds like you must go through a pretty exhaustive process of working with a client up front to really so that you can capture that passion or have it instilled in you by them or, or something, I would assume. Yeah, and, and that's part of their interviews and site discovery, like go and walk the site with your clients. And mm -hmm. I'm working on a lake house right now, and I've been up and down that site it's it's really beautiful and they have a they have a lake they already have a boat house there and so that, that's something to respond to there's neighbors that have recently built that's something to respond to there's the views there's the topography there's the client's sense of uh this is going to be their retirement home uh and they're going to live out their days here so what does that mean and and how and and how many things do you reflect in, in that style. And so it's, it's a process. I think, I think it can always be improved, but basically what I do is, uh, when I sign a work order with my clients, I have, uh, links into survey monkey and I have done detailed, um, profiling surveys in there that they can tell me about their life all the way down to how many people come up, for the holidays and uh, the relationship with their kids and their pets and, and, and how they feel about the nature that's around them, uh, things that they want to achieve, uh, uh, like attitudes and goals that they have uh, within the home uh, that are more than just, you know, tell me the size of the dining room you want. You know, it's more like, what is the art of dining for you? Or what is what does it mean for you to, you know, are you, do you eat casually in front of the television or do you have a breakfast nook or do you eat at the island or do you do this, that, and, and why? How are you feeling? Are you in a rush? Do you want to be in a rush? Do you want to slow down for a minute? I can help. And um, it really gets down to even like spicing up the romance, you know, like you know, lighting in the bedroom and lighting, you know, in uh, out on the the porch, the screen porch that maybe is off of the bedroom or making a connection from uh, the screen porch to the bedroom or, um, you know, uh, also the kids. And, and it's, well, of course, this is a retirement project I'm, I'm referencing, but where I'm working with projects with lots of kids involved, um, you know, how, how does that interaction happen? And so there's really, it really boils down to and, I, and this is something I tell this, I told the students and, and I've communicated with other architects. It really boils down to, we design stages. That's what architecture is. It's a stage. It's a fancy stage. It's a complete enclosed stage. And what is important? Is the stage as important as the play? Heck no. God put us here for a purpose. And we're always uncovering what that might be and, and evolving who we are within ourselves and with one another and in the context of creation. And so everybody writes their play slightly differently. I mean, obviously we get a lot of cues and rituals from our culture, but also in our, in our extended families. 
but also everybody wants to celebrate a certain degree of uniqueness. And so that's why I like to get into that aspect as well. And how do you write your life play? What is your narrative? And then if I know that, I can make a better stage. Beautiful metaphor and refreshing to hear that perspective of just operating, you know, with that heart and love and care uh, for clients. And that, you know, that's something we try to talk about too. And, you know, it carries over to all aspects of our industry. Um, when, you know, we're doing sales training, we talk about consultative selling and really just helping people solve problems and find their best solution. And I tell guys, I'm like, we can teach you how to do this. You know, what really helps if you actually care and want their best interest and the rest, (laughs) it all kind of falls into place. If you operate with that humility and benevolence and and all that you do. So thank you for uh, promoting uh, uh, that perspective. I know I've been through the design build process a couple times with different people. And, you know, I've seen some people who are so good at leading you through that and asking those questions about, you know, how is this really going to be used and, and what do you really want to accomplish? And, you know, rather than just get down to the brass tacks and where does this board go and where does this nail go? Um, so I, again, applaud you too on uh, your ability to, to do that and lead a, lead a client through that process. Very cool. It's not always the most profitable approach. Uh, I bet. <laughs> I just, I'm sure. I will redesign a house four or five times, you know, just to get more and more fine tuned. Yeah. And, and the, you know, my experience in most architecture firms is, you know, do a good job up front with your programming, but let's now be expedient in the production so we can move on. Yeah. Hey, profit profit can be measured in things other than dollars too. So yeah. there you go. Amen. Yeah. 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 True. So Tell me a little bit more about um, your current venture with Rue House Holistic 3D Design. And first, I know you shared with me earlier, but tell us a bit about the name Rue House, how you developed that and what it means. And then um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. Uh, The name really, I I thought the name out over many, many weeks. And um, and I played around with different concepts. I remember before I settled in on Rue House, I was looking at Holy Studios, H-O-L-I, which is the Indian Festival of Color and um, Celebration, but also, you know, phonetically it's Holy, H-O-L-Y. And so it's the idea of bringing forward the sacred because I, I, I love that aspect as you're beginning to see. And I've also done some church designs. But someone else grabbed Holy Studios from for a fashion group in Europe somewhere. So I was like, okay, that one's not available. <laughs> and and so the uh, I started uh, thinking about how can I communicate that architecture is more than just material or even. Um, ecology and sustainability, which is the green architecture movement. Um, How can I really speak to it as a reflection of who we are and as um, something more? And so uh, spirituality, I I kind of sought it through that. I've I've studied other things like Reiki for years and um, also art is is a form of that and 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 also the what can be more spiritual than your relationship with your kids and your spouse and your pets and and mother nature and so it's like you know i want people to really stop for a moment and 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 just think of using 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 consuming 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 and exploiting a thing and begin to realize that they can draw a lot more from their environment than they are or often are. You know, once in a while we have this great moment, right? You're out on a hike at the rim of the Grand Canyon and you do stop and you look at the grandeur of it, right? But there's an inner grandeur. There's a grandeur to every moment in life. And how do you pull that meditation out and I'm not trying to stop someone dead in their tracks and make them late for work. But what I'm trying to do is counterbalance 
that crazy rat race that has kind of driven um, all kinds of problems in society, including anxiety and depression. And so how do you draw that energy? How do you draw that, that relationship and that stronger identity and that groundedness, if you will, um, from, from buildings? And the image just kept on coming back to me over and over again of the Hebrew word ruhach, which means the breath of God being breathed into clay or, or man to animate it, to give it life, to give it consciousness and presence. And um, I just thought, why can't we breathe into a house? And, and, I, and, I, and I just thought that's the spiritual component right there is the breath of God into a house. And so then the house itself, well, I, I'm kind of a little bit of a modernist. I love the simplicity and minimalism of the Bauhaus movement from Germany that, that actually uh, led modernism. And so I decided to spell house, H-A-U-S, from the Bauhaus and um, came up with Ruhach House, which is the way you would say it with the Hebrew and the German. But then I just simplified that to Ruhaus. Plus, I have a lot of friends in New Orleans, and it's rue this and rue that. So, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds good. We, we can work with that. That's incredible. What a neat thing to be able to tell your clients. So, you know, I imagine that that really plays a role strong because I know you've worked a lot in recent years with tiny homes and cabins and container homes, um, really some pretty game changing, disruptive type of structures. Um, so as you try to bring that spirituality and that um, overall uh, image and those, those breathtaking moments into those smaller structures, that has to be really meaningful to you and to your clients. Um, what really has kind of driven your direction toward these smaller structures, uh, though? I'm curious. I actually have one up on my screen right now. I could either aim the camera at it or do a screen share if this format will let you. I don't know that we can do a screen share. Uh, uh, then I'll just aim my camera at it for a minute so you can kind of see what's up. So this is what's on my board right now. Oh, wow. wow. And we're doing, I do 3D modeling. Everything's designed in 3D. I don't do the 2D CAD work anymore. And that, when you, all that is, is a 20 foot shipping container, which is called an open side container. So okay. the two doors, each of the doors is roughly about 10 feet wide. And you can see that they are opened here and here. Those are the doors. Right. Okay. And then we just don't have that much more to frame in. Just have this and this to frame in. And then, and then a roof, of course. Uh, and this is for a cabin at the Red River Gorge in Kentucky. And the, um, see here if I can show you what it kind of looks like in general. Oh, now, wow. now you can help me. Isaiah Roofing might be able to help me here because, hey. uh, you know, I, I love what you guys have said on your website about, uh, incorporating metal roofing and solar so uh, this is meant to be at the angle that we need for solar and at the same time also create a opportunity for a kids loft so the parents have the big space downstairs and the kids in this little vacation space have the um, have the loft up above yeah that would take a second to draw but anyway the uh, so the roof does many, just one simple gesture does many things. It gives, it sets up the loft, it sets up the solar, and it sets up some drama in the living space, which you saw as you, as you, while you were in there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. So anyway, the um, you can you can really apply all of the the ideas, the compositional ideas and the technical ideas and the materiality that you learn in architecture, but also the celebration of things like outdoor space. There's a lot of outdoor space here because it overlooks the lake. And so people are going to want to be outdoors as much as indoors. And then there's folding panels and such so that the indoors and the outdoors can operate together as a unified 
gathering space so you can open the whole thing up and how much is this going to cost me right that's what so many people would ask and and uh we're shooting for like seventy seven thousand dollars wow that's a lot uh, for I mean that's a lot of building for that money. Yeah. That's amazing. that's a lot of value yeah. for for not much. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 we've already achieved with another project in Red River Gorge. We've achieved somewhere between 100 and 120 a square foot. But we're going to do better on this project because we learn our lessons with each build. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So so tell me more about container homes, container construction. Um, just maybe just an overview of how it all works, why you like the concept, um, you know, what you think the potential is ultimately. How How is what's happening right now in the container industry uh, affecting that too? I'm curious. Yeah, there's a, well, because of uh, slowdowns in trade with China, actually, there there was a stockpiling of containers. Okay. So, I mean, you got you kind, of, kind of two balances. One was, you know, there were some price increases because of the, you know, the, um, the fact that there weren't people at work and it was a, more of an effort to, to actually get the work done and get it scheduled and get it delivered. But at the same time, there was more product available. So uh, it balanced out basically. I haven't seen much, much of an impact there. Um, containers have, every building, technology, as you well know, has pros and cons, right? So the, the pros to the container is um, fast up, built-in structure, built-in um, sheathing, if you will, the, the, you know, the metal. Um, it, ha- it, it lends itself to a really cool industrial chic or um, kind of trending tech look, right? Which is, by the way, really nice to counterbalance with something very organic, like a green wall or, or really nice decks and planters or koi ponds and things like that. So you, you, you balance out this, this tech with, with Mother Nature and, and, and that is a fabulous look. Uh, and people, I think, are getting tired. And this is a disruption. People are getting tired of uh, the look and feel of typical suburban track homes or even some of the metro um, townhomes and things like that, even though some of those can be really repurposed in a beautiful way um, and sometimes offer a little bit of the industrial feel. The, um, but it's a popular, so it's a popular look. It's, it, it helps on schedule. It helps on structure if you use it right. There's a lot of people that are doing container housing wrong from my point of view, you know. Inappropriately, I won't use the word wrong, it's too definitive, but (laughs) if you're going to take a container and chop it to smithereens and then start and then and then put three or four of them together, you basically just reduce them to a bunch of pieces of metal that that you're going to apply here and there. You're not using their strength, their integrity. Their, their interlocks. I mean, they already have these wonderful corner blocks that you can interlock with other containers. And so my foundations use the boat locks so that you're actually locking these things to their foundations with affordable uh, metal pieces that are already out there that the ships are using. And um, also I'm keeping the integrity of the pieces in my builds so that um, their structural capacities are still according to shipping uh, criteria. And that's what the cities want to know is like, you know, well, this is a relatively new thing for them. So they get a little nervous sometimes about um, structural capacity. A matter of fact, Cincinnati is having me have an engineer uh, review and sign off on almost every aspect of the container. And, uh, And that's costing the client more than needed to happen. Um, down in the countryside, down here, and Red River Gorge uh, didn't have that kind of requirement because they were more than happy to accept the containers for their their published strengths in the purpose of shipping, which is stronger than residential uh, load capacities, by the way, and so much stronger. And um, 
So another downside to shipping containers, if not done right, is insulation and condensation. Yeah. Right. And so you have to be on on it with that. Another is radiation. They can be a hot box, you know, if, if you don't uh, reflect the radiant um, gain. And some people think that you can just throw them underground and make these really cool underground shelters. No, as soon as you back, you know, backload, they will cave. The sidewalls will cave if, if they're not reinforced. So you have to reinforce if you're going to use them underground. And that's not what they're meant for. Right. Some people think they're fireproof. They're fire resistant because they're metal. But if you sat in a container, even with some insulation, uh, and a wildfire came through your village, it's not going to save you. It it'll, it will get too hot, and it will meet. It will hit melting points, especially the sidings first, because uh, it's thinner steel. So you have to kind of be aware of all of that and insulate really well. Um, help dispel any myths the clients might have, and and then I I my favorite thing to do, even though. It's not the cheapest way to go. You know, for about four or five thousand dollars, you can get either a 40 foot container or a 20 foot container. It's about the same price. You don't save a lot of money on the 20 footer. So you're getting half the square footage for roughly the same price. Why would you want to do that? Well, I'll tell you why you'd want to do that. The 20 foot container is much sturdier than the 40 foot. All the rails that run along this, the, the top edge and the bottom edge, they, they only have to run 20 feet from the corner blocks instead of 40. And so I really like this building block. Um, it's almost like the difference, you know, when you play with Legos as a kid, you get that basic block, right? This little eight nib block. That was the basic Lego block. But do you remember the long flat panels? Sure. Right? And they're kind of bendy. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> Same principle. They're, Same principle. We were trained for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious yeah. that you the consideration for condensation and um, you know the moisture control. You mentioned insulation. Is that is that the primary method you're fighting that, or you making sure to have high quality vapor barriers as well, or what? What are your go tos? Well, the. The insulation folks that I talked to would like me to go to spray foam insulation. Sure. Because that that is it fills every nook and cranny and that's its that's its upside. Sure. The downside is the industry does not typically have on site testing of the mix as it's being made. And there are rare cases of an improper mix not properly curing and outgassing. Um, toxic gases and and so in those situations and there's been shows about this uh, people have gotten sick and they've come back on their insulation contractor and there's a big fight and I'll tell you something in a small tiny home you do not want to risk indoor air quality sure so as much as I'd like to use spray foam until I've got a contractor out there willing to do on-site tests with some kind of monitoring box of the outgassing, and I've not even seen a box like that, but it may exist, um, then, then I'm a little uncomfortable with it. So what I go with is foil-sided rock wool. Okay. And rock wool has, uh, it's water adverse, which is great. It won't get saturated like um, fiberglass bat will. The foil side gives you the opportunity to reflect that heat from the backside of the metal, and you can actually use the metal as a vent. So for instance, I, I use the vent holes that are there and drill extra holes, and so the, any heat that um, hits that metal wall will rise up through the ribs and out, and any radiant will come back out from the foil, and then I hit the rock wall and then typically that's about, I use a two and a half inch metal stud to keep the whole system light. And, um, and then it's just a matter of sealing here and there uh, to make sure the vapor doesn't get to the, um, to the, to the, you know, through 
the wall. And so there's different feelings about vapor barriers based on which climate you're in and which and which direction you're using and, and vapor versus moisture. You always want to block the moisture, but you don't always want to block the vapor. Sometimes you want the vapor to breathe. So I try to, I, I'm still working out the, the ideal wall section. Um, but for right now, um, my client actually went with the spray foam. And, uh, and so I think if I was doing one for myself, I'd probably seal really quick with a very thin layer of spray foam, just certain areas that could, that are likely to see indoor air uh, touch them. Now, the other way, and, and, and that's where your condensation comes from, is, is moisture laden indoor air touching a cold surface. Right. So, so another way to go is to outsulate. Right. It's not, you know, about the drive it systems back in the sure. past couple of decades, right? So they had foam outside of the right. metal structure. And you can outsulate a container, you lose its look and appeal right. because you're not looking at this wonderful container, right? That, and, and, you're, and now you're also having to weatherproof, right? Because now, now all of a sudden your, your insulation is subject to weather. And you don't have that wonderful opportunity to use the core 10 steel from the containers. However, once what the upside to outsulating here and there is to capture more interior space because you've got a very tight space in these containers, right? If they're eight foot out to out, you got about seven foot five or so on the inside, and uh, and then you got to insulate. If you're using the insulation, I call it insulation outsulation. Using the insulation, you're down to about seven feet. And um, whereas you can you can get another six inches or so, and sometimes that makes a big difference in interior layout. So there's a lot of little tricks. Um, I think the ideal package is realizing that everything is in your palette. You can hybrid the approaches on a home. You do a little bit of insulation, a little bit of outsulation, take some surfaces of the of the container, and put them inboard. So I'll give you a really good example. You know what a um, uh, bonus room truss is? I do not. Okay, so if you have a garage and you want to have a bonus room above the garage, uh, truss manufacturers can actually shape out a okay. room in their truss package so that you've got it above your garage. Well, you can basically use your containers as your bearing walls if done right and what i do is I actually run some lvls or whatever i'm getting too technical but anyway i run some some structural members from corner block to corner block and then i set the the truss system on it and now you capture all the space between your two containers and those two containers have given you your exterior walls but and and this is and this is one situation in which I use the forty foot containers with some some extra columns at twenty feet, and so what that's done is it's given you you got a forty foot container, basically the two end walls and one forty foot wall is outside, and then the other forty foot wall is inside. It's facing the kitchen, the living room, bedrooms, whatever, and you can um, cut it up a little bit more and use it aesthetically. So since you have that container on the inside that you're able to use aesthetically, guess what? You don't have to use it as much on the outside aesthetically. Sure. Mm -hmm. So in that system, we outsulate. Okay. Interesting. A lot of the principles sound like very similar things to what we do in metal roofing, um, as far as con moisture control and condensation control and so forth as well. Yeah, I saw that on your site, that you guys are really good at that, at, at looking at um, all the different uh, thermal dynamics. Yeah, try, try to look hard at it. So changing gears a tiny bit, um, looking forward, what do you think are going to be the major motivators for change in construction? I mean, what are those things happening out there that are going to require us to change how we build? You know, a lot of my knowledge on this point comes from being a professor and watching what was going on in the DAP architecture school and also kids coming back from some of the more um, innovative architecture firms from around the country and the world. 
Um, we had um, Adrian Smith, Gord Gill uh, in Chicago. We had um, Big uh, out in Denmark. We had um, students come from a whole variety of really progressive companies and they would learn some techniques and what's going on. And then also some of the professors were tuning into this, of course, and they're trying to keep their students ahead of the curve. You know, you don't want to graduate with an antiquated way of thinking. You, you need to be on top of innovation. And so the push is really interesting. I'm going to hit you guys up with something you may not have thought about. Okay. Okay. The push is for interactive skins on buildings that are 3D printed or manufactured. You know, some of it is is going to be modularized. Some of it is going to be on-site fabricated by robots. It's almost like the auto industry meets, you know, the construction site, you know, and, and you, we've all seen how, you know, robots are doing a lot of auto, you know, manufacture. And so, and, and there's a lot of skyscrapers going up where there's a bunch of robots building level by level as it goes up. And so, some of this is meeting home design. There's been some press out on this little group out of Austin, Texas that's done the 3D printed house. And, um, but there's pros and cons to all of that. Uh, there's just conductive issues with that house. There's, there's other things that I'm not real happy about in that technology. Um, prefabrication, which is great uh, from, from a point of view of efficiency, is not always great from a point of view of customization. And, and site adaption. So where are we going? Well, the programs that the kids are le learning are algorithm-based. And there's a program called Grasshopper, if you've heard about it. And Grasshopper will allow you to put in things like sun path and, and wind systems and a lot of the climate and sustainability uh, performance criteria that, that you would like ideally for your structure and shell to respond to. So, you know, we've been counting on kind of experience and what we've done all along the way, you know, trial by error basically, and, and a little bit, you know, one architecture firm maybe being a little more specialized in one thing than the next and going to the one that does it well. Well, these algorithms enable the program to literally adapt a 3D model. So it's not like the kid says, or the architect says, okay, I'm going to use this particular curve, right? Or I'm going to use this particular arc or, or shape. No, the algorithm tells you what that shape or that form is so as to adapt to all the performance criteria. It becomes a very rational process in which machine learning and architects interaction with um, machines and eventually AI that is driving the form. So, and then, and, and I'm gonna take it one step further. So we haven't even begun to, you talked about collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is gonna start collaborating. There won't be need for a ducting system anymore. Why? Because the skin is, is fabricated to incorporate like a, a circulatory system in your skin airflow. Gotcha. It, has, it, may, it may use um, hydro, um, hydraulics and things like that to keep the space cool, like a radiator does. Okay. Um, and, the, and you've got this transfer medium going through the skin. Right, oh, things will open and close to either uh, receive the sun or block the sun, redirect the air, change the humidity, um, grow plants. You know, and that's another aspect. Okay, so all of that sounds very dehuma dehumanizing, right? It's kind of scary a little bit. So, but there's also another movement, two other movements really. Another movement is to incorporate food production and um, ecosystems into architecture. Okay, and so this is things like aquaponics, the combination of, you know, um, both 
raising fish and hydroponics for plants. And, and it's a much more intelligent um, ecosystem to uh, support in your building. And also vertical garden, indoor gardening uh, with artificial light LED arrays and things like that. And um, uh, you've seen probably plenty of moss walls and, and green walls, and you've seen some green roofs, right, sure, sure. Um, in your day. Have you guys done any green roofs, by the way? We, we have not, no. Yeah, they're exciting. Yeah. No, um, well, they get, and they have some really neat uh, pluses, like, you know, they can add thermal mass and such, um, but at the same time, they're adding weight, right, right. and moisture concerns and, and all of that, of course. So what about all these concerns and these new technologies and, and such? Well, the you know, the, the more and more computer-based and algorithm-based these technologies become, which is inevitable, the more and more that you can interrelate them programmatically into automating design software. So that's kind of scaring the architecture industry a little bit, but that's not a bad thing because what the architect needs to migrate to is how best to craft those algorithms or those performance criteria, how best to prioritize them on behalf of the, uh, a deeper understanding of the play, of the client's needs um, and their holistic well-being. And, they, and it really boils down to this it is holistic well-being. Um, how can that space help your body, help your mind, help your heart, help your spiritual endeavors, um, help you have confidence and energy. You know, can, can, the, can, can architecture add to that game a little bit? Yes, it can. Especially the more and more nature and collaboration and staging of human beings that you do. So once again, it's less about the stage and more about the play, but the stage is becoming very, very sophisticated in the future, immensely sophisticated and also immensely organic at the same time. And then finally, the last motion that I see in the students is that of repurposing um, old architecture. And I think that's a glorious and wonderful thing to do, to go into the old brick, you know, multi-width brick uh, buildings of Cincinnati and other old towns and, or, you know, repurposing an old um, factory or whatever into, um, wonderful things. And we've all seen examples of that. That's actually yeah. a, a strong trend right now. So that will continue as well. It won't be all about everything being new because we're also worried about consumption sure. and resource and sustainability. So what words of advice would you give to a young designer today? Someone who's wanting to make the most of living into that future? Who, who or what should they be paying attention to? Well, I, I think from a mental point of view, they should be focused on um, this idea of computer-driven design, Compu you know, out the algorithms, and, and, and take a look at what, what's the philosophy behind things like Grasshopper and, and game design too, by the way. And um, so they should look at that from a kind of a, a technological mental understanding from a point of view of their heart, I think they should uh, study human beings and themselves and understand how do you drive meaning and value from life um, above and beyond a fancy car or a fancy building, right? You know, but what is the dynamic of relationship and how does meaning and virtue arise from that endeavor? And I think, um, kids don't realize just how much psychology there is in good design and good architecture. And um, so uh, from those two points, and then from another thing, I think they should get out on site. They need to meet contractors. They need to meet inspectors. They need to meet uh, end users. They need to get out there and be present to the site and the building at every phase. All part of that communication. Yes, absolutely. Well, this has been neat. Um, we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, 
and, and I and I really want to have you back again on construction disruption. And you had touched on something as we we're talking before we went live called polarity thinking and, and a gentleman named Barry Johnson. I'm going to dig into that, but would love sure. to have you back sometime to discuss that as well. Um, but um, so we've got one more section we're going to do that I'll touch on here in a second, but I do want to ask you, is there anything else that you really wanted to cover today that we haven't had a chance to cover? Well, I tell you, you've been a great interviewer. I mean, you, you, you've really dug in deep and you got me to say more than I normally would. So uh, uh, you've been great, great guest. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, before we close out, I'm going to ask you if you want to participate in something we call our rapid fire questions. And just to explain this, these are seven questions that may range from maybe a little silly to maybe serious. Um, your only commitment is to give whatever quick answer comes to you. And our audience needs to understand that Billy has absolutely no idea what the rapid fire questions are. So you willing to do it? I'm, oh, yeah, I'm up for it. Let's go. Give it a try. Okay, here yes. we go. Uh, your dream car when you were a kid. 65 Corvette. Awesome. Stingray. Awesome. Yeah. That's still my dream car. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, spiders, snakes, and bats, which is the worst? They're, they're, they're all cool in their own way. I... I suppose snake, uh, snakes, I, I'm going to go with snake, I guess. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, though. That would be mine. I, I know his is spiders. I know that. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I always put spiders under a glass and take them outside. I don't. My wife just swats them right away. And I'm like, no, just take them outside. That's They're right. fine. <laughs> Unless it's a brown recluse. Then we're starting to rise up to the snake level. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Introvert or extrovert? Which are you? Yeah, I, I'm an extrovert uh, with people, and I'm an introvert by myself. I mean, what the heck? Yeah, <laughs> yeah both. Go. I'm sorry. I can't go either way. I'm both. Per perfect combination. Yeah. Favorite summer activity? Uh, going to the beach. Oh, awesome. How many keys are on your keychain? Wow. Which keychain? Yeah, uh, there. That's that's maybe <laughs> the answer this, right there. Yeah, there you go. I have three keychains. Each one of them probably has eight or nine keys on it. Yeah. Cool. First paid job you ever had? That would the. Besides all the classic stuff like shoveling snow and 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 all of that, and and well, I also had a paper route. But the first job where I actually had to report to a place and deal with people and get a paycheck was um, in the dairy department of a and p in New Jersey. A &P Atlantic New and Jersey. Pacific Grocery, yeah. yeah. Good deal. Uh, your first airplane flight, where did you go? Birmingham from Newark. Newark to Birmingham. Newark to Birmingham, yeah. Classic flight. And it had, it had props. <laughs> you, walked out, you walked out on the tarmac and you were met at the stairs by someone, you know, the flight attendant who was absolutely decked out in this amazing uniform. And and there was props, big plane, was prior to jet being the main go-to. Yeah. And of course, you leave with your little flight wings. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Man, I'll tell you, it's been a while since I've been on a prop plane. Have you ever been on one commercially? Have you? Uh, uh, yes, once. Yeah. Used to be pretty common, yeah. but not so much anymore. Thank you. That wasn't so painful. I appreciate it. <laughs> not at all. I appreciate it too. Thank you. I only feel bad that I can't ask you all the same questions, you know, I'm just. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. This has been great. Um, really enjoyed it. Very insightful. Um, great uh, in-depth responses. And I'm going to check out the, I'm going to look at the Cincinnati Convention Center with a new set of eyes and find this display down there next time I'm down there. So um, thank very you good. so much. Appreciate it. Um, do want to ask one more thing. Um, why might someone want to connect with you? And if they do want to connect with you, how can they do that? Sure. Um most of it has been uh, just word of mouth and connections. I, and I've always seemed to have a project on my boards, so I haven't really marketed that hard. But I do have a splash page at rewhouse.com. 
and there's an opportunity to connect there. You can also connect in LinkedIn, either way. Um, so it's R-U-A-H-A-U-S dot com. And uh, LinkedIn, you can find me under Liam quotes Billy Ream. Uh, and um, I'll certainly accept any you know, request to connect. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. And I want to thank our, our viewers and our, and our listeners. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Construction Disruption with our guest, Billy Ream of Rue House Holistic 3D Design out of Florence, Alabama. Please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We have lots more great guests on tap coming up in future weeks. Um, don't forget to leave a review about us on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Um, until then, I encourage everyone change the world for someone, um, make them smile, bring them hope, bring them encouragement. Those are all some of the most powerful things that we can do to change the world, really one interaction at a time, and, and that's something we can do. So um, God bless, take care. This is Isaiah Industry, Seth and Todd signing off until our next episode of Construction Disruption.